Barcelona, uh, originally from Hungary. Gabo is a great expert in uh, everything connected to learning theory and one of the most important things in recent years for learning theory have been concentration inequalities. Uh, he has published a number of seminal papers in the field, a number of very well written books. He's also a very good lecturer as you will uh, experience soon and uh, looking forward to his talk. Thank you very much for a little bit embarrassing introduction. So it's a pleasure to be here, uh, <coughs> and uh, I will try to uh, uh, introduce you to this, uh, this fascinating field of, uh, of concentration inequality. This is probability theory. So if you don't like math, you can leave now. But uh, I would li I will try to argue that uh, that this is useful stuff also for for analyzing uh, learning algorithms in, in machine learning. I think someone, especially a little bit uh, theoretically oriented. Uh, uh, researchers should be aware of this because it's, it, it really gives you a, a, a very rich set of tools that m makes analysis really much easier if you, if you understand this. So, so what, what do I mean by concentration? What's concentration? So in one sentence, what we're interested in is if we have something that depends on lots of random variables, that they are independent, then we, we, we would like to uh, control it's random, the random fluctuations of this something. Okay, so we have a function, which is a, a real valued function, which depends on lots of lots of lots of independent random variables. We would like to know how close is this function to its expected value. Okay. So this is what, what, uh, what this whole subject of concentration inequality is about. Okay. Of course, we know that if we have, uh, this is a classical probability, it tells us that if we have uh, an average of independent random variables, then the law of large numbers tells us that that this average will be close to its expected value. Right? This is just the law of large numbers. But in uh, in in many many cases, more often than not, we don't have just averages, but we have some something complicated, much more complicated function that still depends on lots of lots of uh, independent random variables. So so this course is about this. How can we uh, deal? With, with complicated functions of independent random variables. Okay, so here's, this is the setup that, uh, that I will consider. We have n independent random variables. Independence is the key word. Okay, that's why it's pink. Because that's, that's the, uh, we, we will assume that we have all these variables are independent. I, I, I won't necessarily uh, assume that they, are, they have the same distribution. Independence is enough. So that's one of the beauties of, of this theory. That all we need is, is independence. Okay, so we have independent random variables that take values in some space. It doesn't matter. This this could be a real valued random variable. This could be discrete. Could take values in, in some big function space. Th this could be random functions. Anything. Okay, just independent. And now we have a function that takes these uh, as an input, takes these n random variables and produces a real number. Okay. So uh, a sum would be a, a special case. Right? If we have if we have uh, real valued random variables, then sum or an average is, is, is a function. But now you can think about something much more complicated. And this, of course, is now a random variable. It's a random variable that depends on all these n independent guys. Okay? So I, I we would like to understand okay, is how far is this random variable from its expected value. And uh, concentration inequalities will show us that under very, very nice general conditions, we can guarantee that the, di the difference is not big. Okay? That, that if we have a big complicated function of independent random variables, then it will behave as expected okay? with these high probability. Okay? The law of large numbers just tells us that, uh, that this is the case when f is a, s is a sum or, or, or an average. But what happens when we have something more general? Okay? So, uh, what do what do I mean mean by by we are trying to control uh, the, the the random fluctuations? Well, we want to get upper bounds for this type of probability. So, what's the probability that the value of this random variable differs by its expected value by p, by some some amount? Okay, so for for some positive number, we would like to say say that 
this probability, the probability of z is greater than the expected value plus p is small, and also we would like to say that the probability that z is less than its expected value. Okay. Please nod if you understand, and please raise your hand if you don't. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. So, <coughs> lots of uh, th this has been a hot topic, and uh, and uh, and lo a, lo a lot of advances came from from different methods, and uh, I will try to mention, basically, I will concentrate on, on these two. Uh, this looks scary, but uh, it won't be scary, hopefully, when, when I tell you what it is. Uh, so Martingale's were, were uh, Martingale techniques were, were, used, were, were originally the, the classical tools uh, to, to deal with this type of, of problems. I, I will show you what, what the basic idea behind this, but somehow they are, uh, they, they get stuck. This, these methods are, uh, don't lead, uh, don't lead uh, all the way. Where, where some other methods do. There was a great breakthrough in the mid-90s by, by the work of Michel Talaton. Uh, he, he developed from nothing his own <coughs> way of, of proving concentration inequalities. And, uh, but later, people understood these and developed other techniques based on information theory tools and these uh, logarithmic, uh, total area inequalities. And, and uh, I, will, I, I like this one. Uh, and I will show you how this method works and, and what kind of uh, results it has. Okay? So th th there are a few references here, but this is really a big field now. And, and it's th this field is uh, people have worked on this type of problems in, in real math, people in, in high dimensional geometry, for example, but also in, the, in discrete mathematics, because concentration inequalities, for example, th one of some of these earlier references come from. Uh, people working in random graphs, because in, in the theory of random graphs, you typically have this phenomenon. You have, you have a big random graph, so that, that there's a lot of randomness independence, but then you get something which is a complicated function. So you have a random graph, and you want to look at what's the, set of the, what's the size of the largest click, right? the largest fully connected subset. That's a typical function that, that we might be interested in. Compli very complicated functions, lots of lots of independent random variables. So some of these references, the early work came from, from there, and, and still people in that field uh, are still working on this. Okay. Some people worked in information theory, where, the, where, where this came from. So there, there are lots of people here in, 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 pro in, in, the, in the theory of empirical processes, uniform convergence. Learning theorists have, have also added their fair share in the, in the development. Okay. So there, there's this, this, even if you're not interested in machine learning, and, but I know you are. But if you weren't, this could also be interesting for you. OK, so <coughs> every baby knows Markov's inequality. Okay, this is the probability theory 101. Uh, if we have a non-negative random variable, then the probability that is greater than its expected value plus t is bounded by the expected value divided by t. If you don't know this, try to prove it. It's very easy. Here, z must be non-negative. Okay, this is only true if. Uh, so this is our first concentration inequality. It tells us that that if the expected value, if, if we have a non-negative thing, if the expected value is the, 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 the value of the of the uh, random variable cannot be much 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 bigger than its expected value. Okay, with with, with a big probability. This is a, a very easy. So there's no assumption here apart apart from uh, from non-negative. Okay? Now. <coughs> Still, everybody knows that, the, that Markov's inequality can be used in various ways. Okay. One of the ways is Chebyshev's inequality. So for example, if, if you want to uh, bound that the f a random variable differs from its expected value by more than t, then we can rewrite this event. This is the same that the square of this random variable is greater than the square of this quantity. Okay. Why is this good? Well, because, because now if we use Markov's inequality in for this guy here, then we have something, which is the variance, which, which we know what it is. Okay? And th this is a different inequality if we had just used Markov's inequality for this random variable. Okay? Then we would have got something like the expected value of this absolute value divided by t. No, you have the variance divided by t. Okay? This is Markov. So, so why, why do we like Chebyshev's inequality? Why, why, why is this a, a nice form? Well, because, <coughs> because the variance is something that we can handle, especially 
if we talk about sums of, of independent random variables. Okay, so this is where it comes from. This is why Chebyshev's inequality was born, because uh, Chebyshev, I think he was the first one who, who, who did this, he, he, he was interested in sums of independent random variables. Okay. So if we have, uh, if z is the sum of independent random variables, then the, the, the variance of the sum equals the sum of the variances, and this is where independence comes from. And this is why the variance is, is a nice thing to work with, okay? because, because we have this, this really nice relationship. The, 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 top, the variance of the sum equals the sum of the variances, if we have independence. Okay? So now we can just write down what happened. But, but uh, uh, we can write down uh, Chebyshev's inequality, and what we get, this, these are two equivalent forms. I just rescaled like this. This is just the, the low flush numbers. This is called the so-called weak low flush numbers, which says that if, if these guys have a finite variance, then <coughs> then, uh, then then for for maybe here, then then um, if t is something like n times epsilon, then this guy will go to zero. Okay, so this is the weak low flush numbers, and I, I I really like it in this form because this form shows that, the, the, that this is kind of of the right order of magnitude. What this inequality tells us is that the typical deviations of, of the, the sum from its expected value are of, of the order of square root of n. Or the typical deviations of the average from its expected value are of the order of 1 over square root of n. And this is the right order. This is Chebyshev when he was young. Um, the central limit theorem tells us that this is the, this is the right kind of order. That if, if, uh, if you look at the, uh, the probability that, that, the, that, this, uh, that, that the, the sum differs from uh, its expected value by more than t times root n, then this thing converges to something. The central limit theorem is asymptotic. Chebyshev's inequality is not asymptotic. Okay. But still, if you look at Chebyshev's inequality, then you see that this guy is small if t is large. If, if t squared is larger than the variance, then this will be small. Yeah, and that's, that's the same thing that the central limit theorem suggests. If t squared is much larger than the variance, then this will be small. Okay. But here we get something much nicer, much stronger. This it decreases exponentially when t squared divided by the variance. So, so you can see that something is wrong. Something is not quite sharp in, in Chebyshev's inequality. The, uh, the, the speed at which this decreases as t squared divided by the variance goes to zero is much, much slower than what we would expect if, if we looked at the central limit theorem. Okay. But the central theme, limit theorem, we don't like it because it's, it's asymptotic. And machine learners don't like asymptotics. Okay. So <coughs> what can we do? Well, we, we will go back to Markov's inequality. And uh, we will try to use it in, in another clever way. Yeah. Chebyshev said that write, instead of this, square it and use Markov's inequality lambda. But we can use any Malcolm function. So if lambda is a positive number, <coughs> then I can rewrite this probability as the probability that e to the lambda times this random variable is greater than e to the lambda times. And now I get. Now I can use Markov's inequality. This is a non-negative. This is a non-negative random variable. So I can use Markov's inequality and get something else. Okay. So that's the big trick of what we call Chernoff bound. It's the same trick as Chebyshev's bound, but now instead of the squares, we use the exponential function. And now what do we need to do? We need to study the moment generating function. This, this guy. It's called the moment generating function of the of the random variable z. Okay. So <coughs> Chernoff's method method uh, consists in doing this. We bound we, we get an upper bound for the for the moment generating function, and then that will depend on lambda. We get an upper bound which depends on lambda, and we, we choose lambda to minimize that upper bound. Okay, this is Chernoff. So why, why do we take the exponential function? Again, the same reason as why we took the, the square, because if we have independence, then this behaves nicely. Because the exponential function converts sums into products. 
And if we have independence, then the expected value of a product equals the product of the expected value. Okay. This, this is why Chernoff, actually it was Bernstein, who came up with this method. It was him who, you, who, 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 you, who used this. I think Rus in Russia they still call it Bernstein Chernoff method. Okay. So, so now <coughs> it suffices to, to look at the moment generating function of the individual terms if we have a sum of independent random variables. Okay. So if we manage to get bounds for this guy, then we can go back to the previous slide, plug it in here, and, and see what happens. Okay. So far so good? Yeah? Oh. So <coughs> here's one of the basic cases. So if the axes are bounded, and that's all we need. And I, I, can, I may just assume that they are bounded between 0 and 1. Otherwise, we can just rescale. So if these guys are bounded, then it's easy to bound the, the, the moment generating function of just one of them. It looks like this, e to the minus, e to the lambda squared divided by this. And this is nice. This is for the sub-Gaussian behavior, because If we, ha if we have a, uh, if x is a standard normal random variable, then the, uh, then the moment generating function of this is e to the lambda squared divided by 2. So, <coughs> so, so whenever we have something, a moment generating function that looks like this, it's bounded by the moment generating function of a, of a Gaussian random variable, well, I, I, sh I should say that if x is, let's say, normal, centered normal, and the uh, variance sigma squared, then I should put a sigma squared here. So, <coughs> so these guys have a moment generating function, which is less than the moment generating function of a normal with variance one fourth. Hmm? Of course, the variance of all, all these guys is less than one fourth because, because they are between zero and one. But this is at somehow the right scale. Okay. So this is called Hovding's inequality. It's it's a small analytical inequality. It uses convexity of, of the of the exponential function. It's really not that useful. Okay. But this is extremely useful. And this is Hovding. So if you if we plug this back in the previous slide and you optimize, then this we get this wonderful inequality. So what, what this says is that if we have an average of independent random variables that are bounded between zero and one, then it, the probability that it differs from its expected <laughs> value by more than t that goes down like this. And this is this really now reminds us of what, uh, what we what we saw in the central limit here. It has this nice exponential decrease in t squared. It, 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 it tells us that the, the typical deviations are of the order of 1 over square root of n. And if it's much larger, then, then it goes down exponentially. So this is Hovding's inequality. This is really, really nice and very, very useful. Because now, if, if for example, if you have uh, Bernoulli random variables, that means that the coin flips, independent coin flips, even if they, if they don't have the, the same probability, if the, the different outcomes don't have the same uh, probability, but, but if they are independent, then we have this nice inequality. <coughs> this is completely distribution free. Okay. Something inequality is distribution free. The, 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 uh, that, that means that the, the bound we get doesn't depend on the distribution. All we need is bounded. From a machine learning point of view, this is great because we don't know anything about our data, <coughs> a priori, unless you're Bayesian. But, but uh, otherwise, we don't know it. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so, so all you see is that is that you have you have some independent trials. We, don't, we, we want to infer what happens there, but we we, we can have distribution-free inequality. 
But sometimes we still want to use, so, okay, so one more thing. Uh, <coughs> So th it's wonderful that this is a distribution free inequality, but also it has its disadvantages. So for example, if you, uh, if, uh, if the xi's are, let's say, uh, one with probability p and zero with probability one minus p, so these are, if they are Bernoulli random variables, then, <coughs> then, uh, then, then of course, the sum is a binomial random variable, and then the, well, from the central limit theorem, we, we would expect something like this, that the, the probability that the sum of the average xi minus the expected value, which is now p, is greater than p, this should be something like e to the minus n p squared divided by the variance. Right? Remember, in the central limit theorem, let me the variance shows up here. Okay. And the variance is p times 1 minus p. Okay, so let's say p. If p is small, one minus p, 1 minus p. And I'm sure there's a 2. Okay. So this is what, we would, what the central limit theorem tells us. But Helping's inequality is, is great if p equals 1 half, because that's exactly what we, what we would like to see. But if p is very small, then we lose big time. Right? If p is small, then, then this is much, 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 much smaller than e to the minus 2n p squared. Exactly because of the reason, since uh, Hövding's inequality is distribution free, it has to be prepared for the worst case distribution. The worst case distribution turns out to be a, binom a symmetric binomial. When, when, the, when, the, when we have a symmetric binomial, something like this with p equals 1 half, then this, then this is really what we expect from the central limit. For all, all other cases, we lose. Okay. So Bernstein's inequality, and this, this was the, the, the birth of uh, Chernoff's method. Uh, <coughs> uh, this was the, the basically the first such inequality. It tell, gives us this variance info. It's, this looks, so now, okay, let, let, let's look at this, this inequality. What it says is that now if we have independent random variables, these can be negative. Okay, here, uh, the only thing we, we assume that it's they are less than or equal to one. And, uh, and we have this v thing, which looks like a variance. So if, if these guys had zero mean, that this would be the variance, but this is just the, the, the sum of the xi squared. Then we have this. If, if you think about this case, then uh, then v is just n times p, right? So then you see that we get something like this: e to the minus n p squared divided by two p. But here, right? This would be proportional to p. This is this guy's p here. But now we pay with this t. In fact, this is this t. Got, this t will only kick in when uh, when p is very large. Okay. So v here is n times p. So so this guy will only become important when, <coughs> when p is greater than n times p. Okay. So this is like the, in, the, in the very far tip, in the, in the large deviation region. And actually, you can prove that this is not the case. This corrective term is necessary. The central limit theorem is, is not correct in that, re in, in that regime. Okay. The central limit theorem tells us it's asymptotic, but in, in, in a very specific way. Okay. It says that if, uh, if I look at deviations of the order of square root of n, and now take the limit, then this will converge to zero. But if I want to look at deviations of the order of n, then the story changes. Then, then, the, then this guy doesn't tell, tell me anything. It just says that it's, it goes to zero, but, but it's, it's useless. So this is one of the reasons why non-asymptotic inequalities, in my, in my view, are, are, are very, very useful. Because this is true, no matter what n is, no matter what the distribution is. Okay? So 
one has to be very careful with, with, with asymptotic approximations. It, it may not tell you the whole story. There are different regimes, asymptotics. What's more relevant, it's hard to say. But, but, but an inequality like Gerstmann is an inequality that's always there for this kind of explanation. So far, so good? Oh. So let, let me show you one little application of, uh, of having these inequalities. <coughs> So suppose now that we have n random variables and they, they don't have to be independent. These can be completely arbitrary. See? There's no independence here. Uh, but what I need is that they are sub-Gaussian. They have this kind of moment generating function. So Hövding's inequality tells us that, 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 uh, that binomial, the binomial distribution is like this, it's, it's sub-Gaussian. So suppose that we have and random variables of this type. And uh, we want to s we want to know how large is the large group of these. Okay. Of course, in machine learning, we are interested in this all the time. So we, ha we, we have many trials, many things going on, and, and, and we want to know when, uh, for, for how, let, let's say we have 100 classifiers, classification algorithms that we want to try. And uh, we, we choose the best at the end, that looks best. But now there's a bias there, because maybe the, the one that we chose, that's best because for that particular data, it looks better. It fit, we we, we fit, fit, fitted the, uh, the, the data with that method better. But maybe in some other data, it will be different. So we want to understand how, how far are uh, random variables from their typical behavior when we have many, many trials. Okay, so we, we, I, will, I will show you a concrete application of this. So suppose we have sub-Gaussian. So sub-Gaussian somehow tell us that the, the, the probability that each of these is much larger than the expected value is, is not large. Right? That's what the sub-Gaussian is. Then the largest of these guys cannot be too large. It will be, so one of them should be of the order of sigma. But if we have many of them, well, this is how much we could. Okay. So let's, the proof is one line, it's pretty nice. Uh, <coughs> so how do we prove this inequality? So instead of just looking at the expected, this expected value, we, s we look at e to the lambda times the expected value. Okay? Now e to the lambda times the expected value, e to the lambda, lambda is positive here, so, so this is e to the lambda x is a convex function. So I can bring out the expected value, and, and I, I only increase. This is Jensen's inequality. Okay? If, we have a, if I have a convex function, then the, the value of the function at the expected value is less, right? You know this. So if, we have a, if f is a convex function, then f at the expected value of any random variable is less than or equal to the expected value of <coughs> x. Right? This is called Jensen's inequality. This is basically the definition of convexity, if you look at it. Okay. So the, here we, I use Jensen's inequality, and now the maximum here we have well the maximum is the maximum comes outside because e to the la lambda that's that's an increasing function. So I can put the maximum here. Now I have the maximum of non-negative random variables that's for sure less than the sum of these random variables. So I instead of the maximum, I upper bound it by a sum. But if I have the sum, then, then, I, then, uh, then the sum, because of the linearity of the expectation, the sum comes outside. And what's inside is just the moment generating function of these, lambda, uh, of these yi's. And now I can use the assumption. Okay. Now we have an inequality here. So I can take the log of both sides, divide by lambda, and then then we get, what do we get? We get that the ex expected value of the maximum of the yi's is less than or equal to. <coughs> so we have the log of n divided by lambda plus lambda times sigma squared divided by 2. Here we have two terms. One of them increases with lambda, the other decreases with lambda. So you can 
optimized. We can differentiate with respect to lambda. We choose lambda optimally. This is true for all lambda. Okay? So I can choose lambda the way I like. And if you do, then this is what you get. Okay? Is this a good inequality? This is very good. Because in fact, if you take independent Gaussian random variable, independent and normal, standard normal. Standard normal means that the expected value of e to the lambda times y equals e to the lambda squared divided by t. So if you have standard normal random variables and independent, then you can prove that this is asymptotically the correct answer. Okay. So this is not improvable. But if you have, so the nice thing in this inequality is that here we don't need Gaussianity, just sub-Gaussianity, and we don't need independence. These are completely arbitrary random variables. Okay. All right. So how do we apply this? <coughs> we can apply, this is a classical, uh, classical question in, in learning theory, uniform convergence. So we have, we have a, some space x, that's our, this, our space of observations, and we have n independent random variables that take values in that space, in that space x. Okay. Now, in that space x, we have sets, capital N different set. And we are measuring, we are, we are measuring the empirically the probability of each of these. Okay. It's like when you have n classifiers, then this could be maybe the error rate of each one of those classifiers. And this is the true, the true error which we don't see. Okay. The law of large numbers tells us that Pn of A will be close to P of A. Okay. But we have now many of these. So we want to make sure that, that, that we have uniform convergence. The, these two guys are close, not only individually for each A, but even the largest of the differences is small. Okay. This is absolutely crucial for evaluating machine learning. I, I want to make sure that the, the difference between do these two is small overall. So I, I want to bound the I want to say something about the maximum deviation between empirical probabilities and true probabilities. I know that in individually, for, for if, if you give me a set, for any fixed set, if n is large enough, then, uh, then this difference will be small. That's, that's the law of large numbers. But what's the largest difference? So clearly, if, if I have lots of lots of lots of sets, then I, I, can, I can always find a set which exactly fits the data, and then, then I get something complete nonsense. Now this little inequality tells us that if I don't take too many of them, and I can, I can really take a lot because, because the dependence on the number of them is, is, is logarithmic, then we're fine. So how do we prove this? Well, we just have to look at the moment generating function of these. I will, I will use the previous inequality. This inequality tells us that if, if, if these guys are sub-Gaussian, then, then I have a bound. So I will use this bound here. And all we need to prove is that the di di these differences are sub-Gaussian. We don't care about independence. They, these are not independent, very, very dependent random variables. But th this, this previous inequality doesn't require independence. Okay? The condition of the previous inequality was, ju was just about the moment generating function of the individual guy. Okay. okay, so let's look at the moment generating function of an individual guy. e to the lambda times this difference. Well, uh, I, I just write it out what this means. Pn is just a sum, so that's what we get. Now, <coughs> these are now independent here. This is a sum of independent random variables, and, uh, and as, as I already said, the, the exponential function converts the sum into a product, and then because of independence, I, the, the product goes up. Okay. And now here, we have the moment generating function of a random variable that takes values between, what is this? Well, this guy between zero and one. Right? And this is just its expected value. So I can use Hebbings in the work. This is exactly what Hebbings in equality tells us. If, if I have a random variable which is between 0 and 1, then the moment generating function is bounded by e to the 1 squared divided by a. Now instead of 
for lambda. Uh, here we use it for lambda divided by n, so that's where this n comes from. Okay. Good. So now I can plug it in the in our previous. So I can plug this down in our previous inequality. Okay. In this inequality, it says that if if the if the moment generating function is resolved into the lambda squared times sigma squared divided by two, now is sigma squared is now <coughs> one over n, one over four n here. Okay? So this is this is how we get it. So the largest deviation is bounded by the square root of log number of events that we want to control together divided by the sample size. So this is nice. This, this means that if we have a large sample, then we can we can we can take capital N to be really large, almost exponentially larger than the sample size, which is good. Okay. All right. Okay. So, <coughs> so this is uh, everything that I, I said so far was about sums of independent random variables. But as I said in the in the introduction, we want to we want to. Uh, handle not only sums, but arbitrary functions of independent random variables. Okay? So now we have, we are back to the slide number one. We have independent random variables, and we have some arbitrary real-valued function of these independent variables. Okay? And we want to say something about how close this is to its expected value. Okay? Now, the, the, the big trick is uh, a so-called martingale representation. If you don't know what the marking here is, don't worry. We will not need it. Okay? But this is this is the, the official name of this type. So <coughs> I will introduce this operator, which is the expected value, the conditional expectation, given the first i random variable. So there, there's some kind of order of, of the random variables. Here it doesn't matter because, because of independence. So we just fix an order, and we take the first i of them fix their values, and then calculate the expected value with respect to the distribution of the rest of them. This is what the conditional expectation is. We fix these guys and take the expected value with respect to the distribution of the xi plus 1 to xn. Okay. So <coughs> if i equals 0, then it means that I, I'm just taking the expected value with respect to all of them. So that's the ordinary expected value. And if I fix all of them, all of the random variables, then the expected value, if I fix all the, all the random variables, then the condition expectation is just the random variable itself. Okay? So then these are the full extremes. Okay? If I take these conditional expectations, then I go from the, from the expected value of the random variable to the random variable itself. Now this, then we can naturally uh, introduce these differences. So what's the difference between this guy and this guy? Well, I just take here, I just take one more condition variable. Okay. Here I condition on the first i, I minus 1. I fix those values and take the expected value with respect to the rest. And here I condition on one more. And I look at what's the difference between these two expected values. Okay. Now, the sum of these guys is a telescoping sum. And and uh, and what we get is e sub n of z minus e sub zero, which is just z minus u. So if, if I, th this is a, a, a nice way of writing down uh, <coughs> the difference between a random variable and its expected value. It's just a sum of these are so-called martingale differences. Okay, so this is a, a, the sum of martingale differences that that we can write. You can do this with any random variable in the world, and this is called the Doob Martingale representation, named after this guy. So this is the Doob Martingale representation of an arbitrary random variable, which is a function of an independent random variable. Okay. All right. So what is this good for? Well, the nice thing in, in this representation is that even though now this is not a sum of independent random variables anymore. But instead of independence, we at least get orthogonality. Okay, so what, what do I mean by that? Turns out, and this is very easy to see, I will show it in the next slide, that e even though these random variables are not independent, they are not correlated. They are uncorrelated in the, the random variables. 
And this is called a marking mode. Okay. So here, here's, uh, for example, one nice uh, consequence of, uh, of, of writing the, uh, the random variable, writing the fluctuation, the random fluctuation of the random variable, the difference between the random variable and its expected value as a sum of these marking di different examples. Okay. So if I want to uh, bound, for example, the variance, and the variance is a, is a good quantity. Remember that Chebyshev's inequality tells us that if the vari variance is small, then, then the random variable is concentrated. So this is good to keep in mind that the probability that x, uh, that z minus the expected value of z is greater than t. This is less than the variance of z divided by t squared. Okay? So that's somehow kind of a first order approach. We saw that this doesn't always give, give us sharp bounds. For example, when we dealt with sums of independent random variables, that are bounded, this was ne not necessarily the optimal, but many times you can't beat it. Okay? So let's just start with this inequality first, and, and let's try to understand the variance. Okay? Good, so let's write the variance of an arbitrary random variable. Because of the Martingale representation, I can write it like this. Okay? And now I can expand the square, so there are two kinds of terms here. There are the, the, the delta i squares, expected value of the delta x squares, and there are the cross terms. Okay. Yeah? So far, so good. Now, th the nice thing is that this is zero. This term here is zero. And that follows from the way we define these lambda x. Okay. Why is this true? So let, let me, let me, maybe I, I explain it. What's the expected value? There, there's an index i there, so that means that I will take the expected value and I fix the, the first i random variables. And, and what's delta i? So that, okay, one, one, one thing. Delta i here, if you look at uh, the definition, here we fixed the first i random variables, and here fit this is the first i minus ran one random variable. So if I take the expected value with respect, by fixing the last i random variables, then delta i is a constant. Okay? If I fix the first i random variables, then this guy is a constant. This doesn't depend on the rest of the random variables, because we integrate it out with respect to their distribution. Okay? So that, that's a constant, so, so I, can, I can take it outside this delta i comes outside. I only consider now indices when j is greater than i, right? Because that, that's how I wrote it. I put a two here so that I can only consider it. So delta i comes outside, and now here I have the expected value with respect to uh, <coughs> the expected value of this guy, and here inside I have something like z, the expected value, of z given x1, xj. I have this term and minus, I have another term in which inside here I have x minus 1, xj minus 1. Okay. Expected value of this given x1, xi. But j is greater than i, so that means that j minus 1 is greater than or equal to i. And uh, that means that if I fix these and, th and take the, the expected value of this guy, then simply just using the, uh, what is this called? The, the theorem of total expectation. Just uh, using this formula, this guy up here is uh, the expected value of z given x1, xi. And this guy is the same, x1, xi. Okay. 
that's all we need to know about the conditional expectations to prove this. Okay? That these cross terms go up. That's that's why that's why I said that these are orthogonal. These are uncorrelated random variables. The, the expected value of the product equals zero. So that means that the variance can be written something like the sum of the variances. This is exactly what we saw when at the beginning when we talked about uh, Chebyshev geometry. Right? That was the nice thing about about the variance that it it hit. Right? The variance of a sum equals the sum of the variances. This was true for independence. Now here we have at least formally something that looks similar. Okay? All we need to do, do now is to understand these guys. Okay? Understand these uh, these delta i's. Now, <coughs> what are these delta i's? Just uh, intuitively, we we look at a random variable. depends on lots of things, xm. And now I look at this, the expected value of this given x1, xi. So I fix the first i values and look at the expected value of this. And now I compare this with what I would get if I had only fixed one less variable, x1, xn, given x1, x i minus 1. Okay. Fr from this formulation, you can see that this guy here, the, the only difference between, between these two is that I fix here one more variable. And here I integrate with respect to that variable. So somehow, this intuitively, it should be clear that if this function doesn't depend too heavily on any of the variables, then we should be in business. If this function is stable in the sense that it doesn't, if I, if I change one variable but leave the others fixed, then the value of the function doesn't change, then, then this should be small, this should be controllable. Okay. So, and, and this is somehow the principle that we work here. That if I have a function of many, many, many random variables such that it doesn't depend very strongly on any of the components, any of the variables, then it will be controllable. And, and, and this is the first instance of, uh, of such, a, such an inequality, OK? Um, should we take five minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah? OK, so when, when we take five minutes, then after, after I will show you a very, very useful inequality that follows from this in a, in a 